Uh, so, so thank you very much. I'm just I'm thrilled to be here with you all, uh, thinking about all of these really fascinating issues together. Um, my talk is entitled "Remote Consequences for Non-Consequentialists." Uh, this relates to a project of mine involving business decision making. So I am uh, so I, I work in business ethics specifically. I'm fascinated by business decision making. Um, in particular, I'm fascinated by business decision making from an ethical theory perspective. So my training is in philosophy. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by ethical theories. Um, in, in business decision making, I don't see a lot of room for ethical theories to be used, or I don't see businesses using a lot of ethical theories to think about what should we do in this situation, what should we do in this situation. Um, so my, my aim is to investigate business decisions and look for areas where ethical theories can play more of a role. So uh, in the past, I've written about business decision making concerning risk, especially financial kinds of risk. And I see uh, risk is actually just fascinating as an, as an area for, uh, for business decision making because it's so consequentialist oriented, but at the same time, there are so many problems with consequentialist reasoning about risk in a business context, especially uh, financial risk. Um, and so I, uh, so I, I found that uh, an entry point for my, my ethical reasoning concerning risk, especially concerning non-consequentialist forms of ethical theories. Um, for my, for my, my contribution to our symposium today, I'm thinking about the problem of uncertainty, specifically uh, related to remote consequences, the uncertainty associated with remote consequences. And what I want to argue is that where there is uncertainty in business decision, in business decision making, this is also an, just an excellent opportunity for ethical theories to play a role in business decision making. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm taking uh, Bastiat's inspiration for our symposium, I'm, kind of, I'm taking him at, at, at face level. Uh, I, was, I was so fascinated by the, by the previous session in which we were really getting into the, the, the philosophical heart of, of some of those claims. Um, unfortunately, my contribution won't do that at all. I'm, take, I'm taking him um, at, at face level and I'm thinking about examples of business decisions in which the short-term consequences seem very positive, whereas the remote consequences seem more negative. Um, so from, from my perspective, thinking about business decision making, these are, these are very difficult kinds of examples because the short-term short benefits tend to, uh, tend to dominate in business decision making. So even though a consequentialist theory should reject a decision that has terrible remote consequences, uh, within, a, within a business context, the short-term consequences tend to dominate, and so uh, what we end up using a consequentialist decision-making strategy is a, I guess it's, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a false, it's a false positive. The, the consequentialist theory says that an action is the right one, or says that an action is ethical, even though if, if properly considered, even by the, the, the own lights of that decision-making strategy, consequentialist lights, the decision turns out to have terrible consequences, the decision turns out to be a bad decision or an unethical decision. So my interest here is, uh, is trying to look for ethical theories that won't produce those, those false positives, ethical theories that will look at the, um, at the, at the decisions themselves and will we'll give a reading that these decisions are unethical. Okay, so that's, the, that's my project, that's my interest. Uh, and where I'm, where I'm starting off from is uh, looking for an example that has these kinds of characteristics. And so the example that I've selected for today concerns, uh, concerns predatory mortgage lending. So I'm looking at two decisions made by Countrywide Financial Corporation, the now, is this the now defunct Countrywide Financial Corporation? The now uh, owned by another company, Countrywide Financial Corporation, two decisions that it made during the U.S. housing boom of 2004 to 2006. Uh, these these particular decisions interest me because they appear to have very positive immediate consequences, but extremely disastrous long-term consequences. So they were. Uh, so this was a this was a good example for me to uh, to investigate. So um, what I what I want to do, I want to briefly summarize the two decisions that I'm going to look at, look at a consequentialist way of evaluating uh, the decisions, and then look at two non-consequentialist uh, strategies for evaluating the decisions, one from a contractualist perspective and one from a Kantian perspective. 
And so my thesis is that the, uh, the, the contractualist decision-making strategy gets us halfway there. Uh, it, it, it gives a, uh, a false positive for only one of the decisions, but that the, the Kantian strategy relying primarily on the, the idea of universability, that the, the Kantian strategy is going to be the I don't know if I want to say the best, but the, 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 Kantian, the Kantian strategy is going to have uh, a lot to say about decision making concerning uncertainty in a business context. So the, the two actions that I'm interested in are uh, broker's discretion and novel mortgages. So in broker's discretion, Countrywide gave discretion to its brokers to decide whether to sell a borrower a prime, a prime mortgage or a subprime mortgage. So here we're thinking primarily about low-income borrowers who are somewhere somewhere in the middle of a, of a prime borrower and a subprime borrower. In other words, the, the, the qualifications that they're presenting, their credit score, uh, their, their money in the bank, their income, are intermediate <coughs> between prime qualification and subprime qualification. So now, obviously, as you know, it's much better to receive uh, a prime loan. Prime loans have lower interest rates uh, in, the, in the context of the housing boom in particular. Uh, prime, uh, prime loans are, have, uh, have lower fees. They're just they're a much lower cost way to take out a mortgage. Um, so it's in, the, it's in the interest of the borrowers to receive a prime mortgage rather than a subprime. Countrywide says we're going to have our brokers use their discretion. Um, and I believe that the motivation for, for giving brokers discretion was the idea that the, the brokers will be able to rely on their expertise to distinguish, is this, is this borrower really more of a risk? Should he or she get a subprime? <coughs> or is this borrower, despite apparently not great credentials, actually uh, better suited for a prime loan? Um, the second decision that I'm interested in concerns novel mortgages. So, so novel forms of mortgages that were prevalent during this U.S. housing boom um, that, were, that, that differed from, from standard mortgages basically in being easier, easier to get and easier to get larger loans. So whereas, uh, whereas a standard kind of mortgage generally requires 20% uh, down payment, uh, doesn't, uh, generally a standard mortgage, a very large standard mortgage isn't given to someone that has a very bad credit rating. Uh, during, during this period, Countrywide was experimenting with a variety of different forms of mortgages. Um, so mortgages that required no down payment or very small down payment, um, mortgages that, uh, very large mortgages, uh, half, a million, half a million dollar mortgages given to people with very bad credit ratings, and uh, third, the third kind of novel mortgage that I, that I was interested in is the, the mortgage that is so large that the borrower has you know, only $500 left over each month to provide for his or her other needs. Traditionally, these kinds of mortgages were not being given in the housing boom. They became um, more interesting. So I start with my uh, consequentialist analysis. Um, and here I'm distinguishing between uh, time t equals 0 and time, time t equals 10. So t equal, uh, time t 10 is basically our perspective. Uh, housing boom is approximately 10 years ago. Uh, time t 0, I'm thinking primarily of the the way the decision looks to the, the way the decision looks to the, the brokers and the borrowers of the company at the time they're they're making the decision. So um, so when they're primarily concerned with the immediate consequences, but before they've actually made that decision. So um, my analysis, uh, my, my simple analysis, is that the um, brokers' discretion, both brokers' discretion and novel mortgages, had positive consequences, had positive pos proximate consequences for the borrowers, for the brokers and for the company. So uh, broker's discretion, um, positive consequences for the borrowers in the sense that the borrowers were receiving mortgages. Now you may say, well, it's not so great to receive a subprime mortgage if you actually qualify for a, for a prime mortgage. Um, so my sense is that the, the borrowers did not realize their own, what the, their, kind of their own credit worthiness. Um, and so the, the consequence of receiving even a prime loan, uh, I, I'm sorry, even a subprime loan, was positive for the borrowers in the sense that 
they were receiving they were receiving a mortgage, they were buying a home. And remember, it's a housing boom. They're buying a home in a housing boom. They have the expectation that the, the price of their home is going to increase. They may even have the expectation that they will be able to sell their home quickly for a for a great profit. Um, broker's discretion was definitely good for the brokers, especially when they were able to assign subprime loans to borrowers who were otherwise qualified for prime loans. So prime borrowers are the kind of people that you want to make loans to. Prime borrowers are the kind of people who are going to repay their loans. You want to make a, a loan to those kinds of people. At the same time, it's great if you can make a subprime loan to a, someone who uh, with prime characteristics. The subprime borrower is going to pay more in interest and he or she is going to pay more in broker's fees as well. So you, as the broker, are doing great <coughs> with your broker's discretion. Similarly, the company is, um, the approximate consequences for the company are extremely positive. Uh, the company is, is making many, many mortgages, selling those mortgages, bringing in, in lots of profits. Uh, the, the, the stock price is increasing, the executive salaries are increasing, the approximate consequences for the company were very good. Um, without kind of belaboring the approximate consequences for the novel mortgages, they were also, they were also quite positive. Um, especially right when those mortgages were being made. Uh, so many people who were unable, who had been previously unable to purchase a home, to take out a large loan, were able to get these, get these huge mortgages. They were able to buy, they were able to buy homes, they were able to move into those homes. Very positive for the borrowers. Positive for the brokers, uh, more commissions, more profits. Positive for the company. The, uh, the remote consequences, according to, according to my hypothesis and the kind of simplified um, analysis here, the remote consequences were extremely negative. So as we know, um, many of these borrowers have gone into foreclosure. They've lost their homes. The brokers are no longer bringing in those great commissions. The company was sold in 2007 to Bank of America for an extremely reduced valuation. Um, in, in the case of the, the broker's discretion, um, as a result of the broker's discretion, the Department of Justice showed that the uh, that Trumpler Financial discriminated against borrowers of color uh, on, a, on a wide scale. In other words, by, by using discretion, brokers subtly discriminated against borrowers of color, uh, assigning, assigning borrowers of color to subprime loans at a far higher rate than they assigned white borrowers to subprime loans even when the borrowers of color were, uh, even when the borrowers of color had the same qualifications or even better qualifications, um, so the the, the long-term consequences for the company were also quite negative. Um, <coughs> and same thing with those with those novel with those novel mortgages, foreclosures, uh, terminations, bankruptcy, being sold at a, at a highly reduced valuation. Okay, so. Um, so my, my conclusion from this kind of preliminary analysis is that a consequentialist, a consequentialist theory is suboptimal for evaluating this, these decisions. Uh, and so my analysis is that it's suboptimal because of the uncertainty of the long-term consequences. Now, clearly, if the, if the long-term consequences could be foreseen at the time, at, at times, at, at, time T0 when the decisions were making were being made, then those consequences, the, those long-term consequences could be considered. Um, but the but this this example is in, is intended to to present a situation in which those uh, those long-term consequences could not be seen. So my proposal is to or my uh, my effort is to use two different decision making strategies to see if they can give uh, a better ethical evaluation of the decisions at time T0. So I started with uh, contractualism. So contractualism, as I was using it, is broadly speaking the, the, the idea that in order for an action to be right or ethical, all of the people who are affected by that action must be able to agree to that action. Um, so the way, that, the way that I think about contractualism is that people must be able to agree to the action from whichever perspective they, uh, whatever, whichever the perspective they intend to hold. So when you're using consequentialism to think about uh, possible action, you think, okay, what if, I, what if I'm the borrower? What if I'm the broker? Um, what if I'm the company? You bring in all of these perspectives into the decision making and you think, is, could I agree? Could I agree to this action ahead of time? Could I could I agree from these various perspectives? 
Um, in the case of the broker's discretion, I believe that the borrowers would not agree to, uh, to the discretion if they were fully informed of, uh, of all of the, of, of if, they, if, they, if they enjoyed the information that all of the different perspectives enjoyed concerning broker's discretion. In other words, the, the brokers presumably uh, the brokers presumably understand that they can assign the borrowers to prime or subprime loans based on their discretion. Uh, if, if borrowers realize that, if borrowers realize that they may be misassigned or they may be um, unfortunately assigned to the subprime category as, a, as opposed to the prime, I believe they would not consent to, uh, to that action. In other words, I think that the contractualist perspective shows that the broker's discretion relies on deception, that, it, that it's actually a prohibited action. So I think the contractualism is very helpful here in, in isolating wrongdoing at the, t at the time of the action. In the case of the novel mortgages, though, I think a contractualist viewpoint would endorse novel mortgages. Uh, in other words, even if fully informed of all of the different perspectives, I think that, uh, that, that the, the borrowers could agree to novel mortgages. Uh, at, the, at the time that they're receiving those mortgages, they're receiving mortgages after all. The brokers could agree to the novel mortgages, they're receiving, novel mor uh, they're receiving those commissions after all, and the company can also agree to the novel mortgages. It's only when the remote consequences are known that the, the borrowers may say, no, you know, actually I don't want to, I don't want to take out a, a mortgage with 0% down, or, I, or maybe even worse yet, a, a mortgage with 5% down where I'm likely to lose that 5%. Um, similarly, I think the, the brokers and the company would not endorse uh, the action from a contractualist viewpoint once the remote consequences are known. So in this sense, I think that contractualism, contractualism gets us halfway there. Contractualism points out the importance of publicity for, uh, for ethically evaluating an action. Um, it, it, it points out the, the, uh, the importance of everyone knowing what's going on in order to evaluate the action. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't get us quite there. It doesn't show that there was anything unethical or anything problematic about the novel mortgages uh, action. So just one more slide. Um, uh, using the, the Kantian perspective, so I mentioned um, everyone's obviously familiar with Kantianism, but I'm primarily using the, uh, the first formulation relying on the idea of universal, universalizability. So what I like about universalizability is that, it is that it brings in this idea of transparency and publicity. That an action is only going to be the right one if, if, every, if everyone is informed about it. If, you can, if, you, if, you are, uh, if, you're, if you're holding yourself to the same standards that you expect from other people, that's the only way for an action to be ethical according to Kantian lights. Um, and so that obviously has nothing to do with the, with the consequences of the action. Um, so in the, in the case of the broker's discretion, um, as you know, when we, uh, we, especially when we use the, the first formula, uh, we, can, we can formulate a maxim and we can investigate that maxim. So I have a, a proposed maxim. I target prime borrowers to higher commission paying subprime loans in order to earn more commissions. Uh, so my argument, my, my argument using Kantian ethics is this, this could not be a universal maxim if everybody knew that the, that the, the brokers were targeting prime qualifying or, or good, good qualifying borrowers to subprime loans. Uh, a low income borrower isn't going to go to any broker that they know will misassign them or, will be, or who will have a tendency to assign them to a subprime loan even though they may be better suited for a, for a prime loan. So in that sense, the, the Kantian analysis has the, uh, the, the Kantian analysis resembles the contractualist analysis, um, both in, in saying that the, the broker's discretion action is unethical, and also in the, in, in, the, in the reason for which the action is considered to be unethical. Namely, if everybody knew that this was going on, no one's going to want to participate. So my, my argument is that the universalizability test is also effective on the novel mortgages action. So for my maxim, I said, I make riskier than normal loans to subprime borrowers in order to take advantage of government subsidies that allow me to earn higher than normal profits. 
So it's not just the like the, the riskier than normal aspect of the of the novel mortgages. I think that makes them ununiversalizable. Uh, ununiversalizable. Uh, when, when using, I mean, this is a this is a, a problem with Kantian ethics that has been well known for uh, for hundreds of years. That uh, that. In, in, in saying, can an action be universalizable, you can't enforce a kind of homogeneity across a, a population. It, just, it, is, it isn't plausible that every mortgage lending company is, is ethically required to have the, the, the exact same risk tolerance. Um, I do think, though, that this, uh, that this action would fail if universalized in the sense that why do people take out mortgages? They take out mortgages because they have an expectation that they'll be able to gain a home and be able to repay those mortgages. Uh, the only reason, though, that people have this expectation that when they take out a mortgage, they'll be able to get a home and repay that mortgage is because generally the mortgages are, that are given out by financial institutions are repayable, that, that, that it's possible to repay them and people do repay them. So in that sense, I think that these novel forms of mortgages are relying on that, 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 gen, that general norm that the mortgages that are given out, people are able to repay and people do repay them. And I think that this, uh, that this action made itself an exception from that general standard. Uh, the, this, this, uh, this action relied on the general standard that people generally repay their mortgages in order to entice uh, borrowers to take out these mortgages or perhaps in the case, if we were talking about uh, the predatory borrowers, perhaps in the case of the, the predatory borrowers enticing the, the brokers to make them these, uh, make them these loans. Um, so my argument is that this, only, this action only works if it's an exception from a general norm, and that makes it prohibitive according to Kantian ethics. Um, the, the conclusion of the conclusion of the paper isn't like substitute Kantian ethics for all kinds of business decision making. So some problems with that have, have already been pointed out in the in the last session. Uh, but my idea is that where conditions of uncertainty obtain, Kantian ethics provides a, a valuable additional perspective as well as contractualism. That's what I have. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much.